In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I would like to uh, greet you in the respectful way that Ojibwe people would greet people in 1869. That means, hello, you are all my relatives. And in fact, a few of you are. <laughs> so, but, and, and I've seen so many of you that it's so wonderful to see that um, many of you are my adopted relatives as well. So, singular honor for me to be here and to be asked to, to, to speak. Um, I have been reminded by many of you, however, that you know a lot about me. <laughs> and that a, a, a significant number of you have reminded me that you know a lot of negative things about me. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure why that was presented. A, a number of you have been very generous and said that you're very excited to hear from me. And you'll forgive me for getting kind of a sinking feeling um, with all of my relatives here, all my friends here, and all these people who matter to me. I would say that, that this is probably the most significant crowd I've ever preached to. Um, there's no, absolutely no pressure here. <laughs> and, um, and we'll see what, what we can do. Um, when I was seven years old, I don't know who the bishop was, but the bishop came and um, my parents suited me up probably the last time I wore a bow tie. And we were sitting over in that section on the side, and back then there were no pews. The elders will remember when there were pews, there were just these kind of rickety chairs that were there with pew sections in the back. And I was sitting there and I um, was sitting next to a friend whose name will be uh, kept out of the sermon to protect his identity. And the, it was a confirmation, so it was particularly long, and the confirmation classes back then were huge. They went on and on and on. And the bishop there, bishops were, I think, more characters back then than those of us today. <laughs> he kept on going, Daily increase in my Holy Spirit more and more. <laughs> and, and it was it was a kind of a spooky thing to hear. And everything was okay except my friend sitting next to me began in his seven-year-old fluty high voice, more and more. <laughs> and I thought this was extraordinarily funny. <laughs> I, it was, uh, the setting and the spookiness of it, you know, and then this little voice going, more and more. Anyway, so I started laughing, which back then you didn't do in church. Um, and my mother was, I, I looked over at her and I could see on her face that she was thinking of the death penalty, penalty at age seven. And, and so I, that kind of took the wind out of my sails a bit. But it was one of those things where you were trying hard to hold back and then you snort. Yeah. And so I snorted and that made my friend, he, even, he went, he went crazy too. And then he kept on saying more and more, I, I'm, those who know my mother realize that I'm here today is a, a, a great testament to, to her compassion at that moment. <laughs> so here I am, uh, this place that means uh, so much to me. Our, our theme really is the love of God incarnate and the embodiment of Jesus Christ in a people and a time. That's really the theme of the occasion and the lessons and all of those things. But 
I would like to uh, say four things. Um, I would like to uh, begin with a tribute to this place and, and really to all of you and to the many people uh, like Bob Hartman who have meant so much to me over my, the course of my life. I'd like to have uh, a, a simple lesson from the readings that we have a simple lesson from the occasion, and then to be close with a word about our task, about what we are here to do. If that sounds long, um, it's going to be okay. Just, just hold on for a minute and we'll, we'll get through there. Um, this place has formed me in many, many ways, and I wanted to give you a couple of snapshots of that. Um, uh, for those of you who are younger, snapshots go back to cameras, um, what you have in your phones. And, uh, and these snapshots um, are things that will help you, I hope, understand how much this place has formed me. Um, to this very day, when I hear the words, the beauty of holiness, I think of this place here, of the music, the words, the liturgy, and the building itself. Uh, this place, for me, has always embodied my understanding of what worship should be like, and this is a, an important thing to me. I, I guess I'm always looking for this place and the experiences it gave me. The other snapshot I can remember as a child, uh, seeing my father pray. It, it was an extraordinary thing for me. Um, things back then were a little different. We are a little more focused on ourselves than we were back then. But as a child, to see my father kneel and pray to his God shook me up. I, th I think you have to understand what it was like because I had always depended upon him entirely. And he was such a strong figure in my life, and still is, um, even years after his death. But to see him kneel before his God and to pray and to concentrate on prayer. It shook me up as a child and that image stays with me today. When I kneel to pray, I think of that moment and how much it has shaped my mind and my heart. And a very simple thing. I'm sure he never even thought about it, but a beautiful thing. Another snapshot of my life, I, I had a bad concussion when I was in second grade and I was hospitalized and I woke up with the, the Reverend John Hildebrand standing next to me and it was Easter Sunday and I don't, I, I don't know why we weren't in church on Easter Sunday but I was on my bike and I, I guess this is a lesson about going to church, you know. Um, especially on Easter Sunday, I was on my bike and I, I took a turn too sharply and, and I had a bad concussion. Anyway, I woke up with him in his black cassock, standing over me and praying. I will never forget that for, the, for as long as I have memory. I will remember that, the power of it. And the uh, beauty of it and the awesomeness of it at the same time. Uh, perhaps a simple act for him, it, it meant the world for me and speaks to me volumes about who we are and what we are to be. The other thing that I would mention is the kindness of people to me, particularly after I came back from a seminary and served here. And, through the kindness of Bob Hartman and his advocacy, um, I had to go through a number of hoops, which you do to get ordained, and 
some of them were pretty rugged, and I wouldn't have made it without Bob, but also I had this army of especially um, elder women. Some of you are here, and you, you look like you would rip the throat out of anybody who said anything bad about me. <laughs> and, and that was, that was a, such a, a wonderful and graceful thing. So I learned a lot from all of the people here, and the kindness and generosity of all of them meant the world to me, still means the world to me. And I, it, gave, it gave me the sense that I was a hot property. And, uh, and that um, whether that's true or not, it was, it, was, it was the thing that helped propel me in my ministry. It's a, it's a great thing. So, um, to, that's a tribute to this wonderful place. Now, having given that tribute, I want to say that the lesson from our Gospels is, is not hostile to tributes, but it wants to put tributes in their proper place. So, the message of our lessons, if you sum them all up, and this is an important thing, on another Sunday I would have spent more time with them, but but for this one, let us understand that the point of the lessons is to God be the glory. If you have given all your best, the achievement is not just the human achievement. It is the power of God in your midst that is your greatness your joy, your glory, your crown, your goodness. And this is an important thing when we remember all of the things, the sacrifices, the goodness, the quirkiness, the wonder of being a group of human beings gathering together. We have to remind ourselves that this is a group of people gathered together in the name of God. And that that power and that that strength is the magic, or what it says was called the deep magic, that allows us to find grace and goodness in a group like this. That is critical and important. That's the simple lesson from the from the lessons. I'm close to close to being finished. The second, the second simple lesson that we derive from is from this occasion. Um, I was the rector of a parish in Portland, Oregon, and I asked them, what's your understanding? I think that's that little kid. Um, it sounded a lot like, anyway, I, was the rector of a parish in Portland, Oregon, a wonderful place, very courageous people. I asked them what their vision of, of mission was, and they described it. Um, they were in downtown Portland, and they said, when people come here to interview for jobs, they stay at the fancy hotels downtown, and before they um, move out to the suburbs, we try to capture their attention and hope that they will will be interested in our church. And I said, that's your view of mission? <laughs> and they said, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I said, so in the densest population in the state of Oregon, the best we can look forward is trying to hijack people before they move to the suburbs? <laughs> is that the, the vision that we have? And basically what they were telling me was, um, we are trying to get our people into the into the pews. And I understand the sentiment, but I don't, don't think our ancestors would have understood the sentiment at all, or even, or even a little bit. They saw their task as not appealing to a, a thin spectrum of the demographic uh, spread. They saw their job as appealing to the community everybody. And they realized 
that these pews had to have spaces in them for people that weren't like them. And here is, that's, that's not really my message. My message is that at a time when things were much more difficult, much more challenging, and I think much more, um, much less optimistic than the, the world that we live in, they looked at the community that was forming around them and they saw nothing but opportunity. They, they, they were confident that what they had to offer was going to appeal to the masses, that it was going to appeal to people with broken hearts and broken lives, that it was going to appeal to people who um, needed what the gospel of Jesus Christ offers and the lifestyle of Christian discipleship makes possible. So, I, I believe that we as, we're, we're being helped by our presiding bishop, but I believe that we've lost some of our nerve over the past century or so. And we've lost a sense of what the power that, of, of who we are and what we are and what we have in Christ, the power of what that could be and what that could do, not just to bless us and our families, but to bless a community and to, and to understand that our, our work is not just to attract a few people to a, an, a, a, an elite experience of worship, but our task is to see a world transformed by the love of God. And to believe, regardless of what things look like in the world around us, politically, socially, spiritually, that there's nothing but opportunity out there. And that we have great things in, around us and ahead of us, and this is a good thing. That's, I think, the simple lesson from their occasion. The final thing that I want to say, and usually I'm trying to get out of the pulpit, but I'm enjoying this so much seeing <laughs> there that I, I'm half tempted to keep talking, but, <laughs> but I, will, I will actually end my sermon now. Um, I began with a story about how spooky I thought worship was here. Um, the funniness of this old man saying more and more. He was probably younger than I am now, but he, he, he will forever be an old man in my remem remembrance. And there was this aspect of this um, life that um, was kind of spooky. And there is an aspect of our faith that makes us think um, that we are being called to be something other than uh, normal. And um, I think that our task in the world in which we live today is to be human. To be human in the face of the cruelty, injustice, and nastiness that is in this world in which we live. To be human, to live humanly, in the face of all of the difficulties. That's really, when you boil it all down to me, that is our, our task. And that is what you have been to me, uh, thanks be to God. So, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is not to be an example of us, of something unattainable. It is to guide us in understanding what it is to be human. And this is a, a, a wonderful thing. We are to be transformed in the mundaneness of our lives, in the normalness of our lives, in the compassion of being parents and uh, being partners and to being friends. You certainly have been that to me. I am more of a human being because of this place. 
let us all join in the name of Christ in the noble task of being a human in the name of God in the face of all of the other things that surround us again and again. Uh, thank you very much for listening carefully and thank you very much for being who you are. Amen.